Hello everyone and welcome back to Full Recovery. Today I have the opportunity to interview my friend Lacey McCray and I know many of you will already know who she is but in case you don't um, she's a, uh, been a friend of mine for a few years and uh, more than I care to count because um, I always joke about it we um, we first met when Lacey was in the second grade and I was her student teacher I was in third grade and <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I was a senior in college and uh, Lacey was in second grade. And then, of course, we um, her parents are Dr. and Mrs. Ray Young. And, and so uh, we've been well acquainted for a long time. And uh, so I was very happy. We're actually at the summit, the Northeast Vision Summit here in Berlin, New Jersey. And um, she so gracious, graciously agreed to, I couldn't even say that word because it <laughs> is so not appropriate. <laughs> She very graciously agreed to um, do this interview, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks yeah. for having me. Well, this is wonderful. I'm glad you got to come this week, and mm -hmm. so many people are here. It's really, it's been a great few days. Um, in case you don't know what the summit is, I should explain. It's a meeting really for Northeast pastors and, and uh, churches, um, but people do come from other parts of the country, and um, it's at the Solid Rock Baptist Church in Berlin, New Jersey, and the Clark family um, does an amazing job in their church family of hosting this event, and uh, it's been a blessing to us for, for many years. So, yeah, so we're glad you got to come. You had quite an adventure getting here. We did, yeah. yeah quite the layover at Midway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here, and now already it's Thursday, and yeah. tonight is the last service, so um, it always goes by so fast. Um, but I wanted to just have a chance to uh, talk about you and get to know you a little bit better. And uh, you are married to? Jason McRae. Jason McRae. Yes. And you have two children, do. two McKen girls. Mackenzie and Lindsay. Mackenzie's 10, Lindsay's nine. So, yeah. And they're wonderful girls. They are. This is yeah. their first time to come to the summit, so they were really excited. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's funny when you, um, when you come here, you really see how important the children are. Yes to um, to this church and, and the Clark family. And I think it's because uh, both of the Clark brothers, you know, obviously grew up in a preacher's home. And yeah. so uh, we almost feel like sometimes everything is designed for the kids and teens and yeah. the adults are like, ah, oh, you guys go do this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I love it. Our kids grew up coming here and um, I really feel like it really helped a lot in their development. So um, I just wanted to find out some, a few things about you and, and uh, some of it I know, some of it I might not. So we'll all be surprised together. But um, what did God do when you were especially young through your youth? So what did he do to draw you to himself? Sure. So my salvation testimony, um, I always remember that my mom was sitting with me on my bed one day. And I, be I believe I was about five years old. Um, and I'm kind of jumped the gun here, but um, I struggled a lot through my teen and college years with the assurance of mm -hmm. my salvation because I could not remember details. And uh, I can get into that in a minute, just what the Lord did to really give me the assurance. But, but what I do remember is sitting on my bed with my mom in my room and I can still remember like the wallpaper and everything and, you know, 9500 North Cot, Munster, Indiana. And uh, mom had her Bible open on her lap. I can picture that. And I, I remember knowing that that's what we were talking about. We were mm -hmm. talking about, you know, getting saved and salvation. Um, I don't remember necessarily praying or, you know, what I said and everything she said. But what I do remember is jumping off my bed afterwards and running downstairs and yelling the whole way, Daddy, I got saved, Daddy, I got saved. And I just remember being very, very excited about that. Um, like I mentioned, I did struggle and got the, tried to get the reassurance of my salvation several times through the years. Um, and, you know, I've said this before that, uh, you know, God, obviously we all get saved the same way, mm -hmm. but God uses very unique yes. uh, ways to draw people to himself and to give that assurance. And... Um, your own husband's testimony has been an encouragement and a, I guess a strengthening, you know, reassurance for me as well. But um, when I was on deputation with my husband many years later, um, I was asked to give my testimony for probably the first time that I ever remember being asked to stand up and give it publicly. Hmm. So, you know, here I was traveling to be a missionary and asking people to give us money so that I could go tell people how to be saved. And there was still that little bit of like, you know, I guess doubt, you know, but that Sunday morning when I was standing in a ladies class um, being asked to give my testimony. Um, I remember the night before I had been trying to write notes down and 
you know, figure out. And I, I remember thinking, which time do I tell them about? <laughs> which I, you know, I think that I don't think I was struggling with whether or not I was saved anymore at that point in my life. I think I was just struggling with what would I say that would convince other people that I am mm -hmm. saved, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so that day though, while I was giving my testimony, I had decided to give the five-year-old version, you know, the, the, sitting on the bed with my mom. And um, while I was speaking, it was kind of like I was having this thought and saying it, for the, you know, at the same time. And I know the Lord pressed on my heart that, you know, I did not reject the Lord mm -hmm. that day. I know that when I was presented with that truth, and there was so much evidence of that throughout my life as well. I've had to grow and learn that as well, the, you know, the spirit bearing witness with, with our spirit. And my husband, um, many years later, as after I married him, of course, he started um, teaching that when you give your testimony, you should attach a verse to it. You should, uh, you know, obviously we have the Romans road, but I mean, a, a verse that like especially gives you the assurance or mm -hmm. just something that the Lord used in your life. And um, it was actually not too long ago that this part all came into play that the Lord gave me um, John 1, 11 and 12. Hmm. Um, he came into his own and his own received yeah. him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. Hmm. And that has been my assurance verse that, you know, um, and again, I'm very settled in that now, but I just, that verse is the verse that I really cling to as, you know, I know that when I got saved, I did not reject him. I know I received right. him. Right. And um, I, I think just as thankful as I am for my salvation, I am so thankful for that day that I was standing in front of those ladies and the mm. Lord spoke that to my heart. I almost could not wait to get to Jason after Sunday school that day to go tell him, guess what? I've mm. been saved all along. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. My husband has often said that um, salvation is instant. You know, we Correct. believe on Jesus and that's it. And uh, But for some people... It is a process, yeah. not, not not for God, not on God's end, but their end. Yeah. And it almost is a, um, you know, a, a process of time and things coming in your path that God sends to affirm, right. yes, you are my child, right. you are, you know. And the Bible does tell us to examine ourselves. Right. Uh, in the beginning of 2020, that really hit me. I was driving a great distance by myself one day, and, um, and boy, it just jumped out at me like a ton of you know just a ton of bricks fell on my head um are you really saved yeah. you know examine yourself because this is this is real this is life and death yeah. and of course i i am and i was and but i thought you know i can see um how it is a struggle and of course my own self i got assurance of my salvation at nine mm -hmm. so um i think for most people it's a it's maybe a bit more of a process till you get that Assurance. I think especially yeah. when you're saved at such a young yes. age. I think a lot of people that get saved mm -hmm. young, not everybody. I've heard some people say they got saved at five and have never died right. since. Yeah. But I've heard many mm -hmm. more people say that they were saved at a very young age mm -hmm. and then later on had to struggle to really, you know, um, have that assurance yes. or just be firm on that. So. Yeah, there is a myriad of reasons about that. Um, lack of memory or just what I know. Uh, I was talking with a woman who just could not remember praying. Yeah. She just could not remember. She she believed she did it. but um, And so whatever the reason is, it's important to get that mm -hmm. settled. And it's nothing to be, uh, I mean, salvation is the greatest thing in the world. So right. nothing to have any trepidation about. Um, so obviously, you um, we're going to talk about how you have served the Lord with your life. But how did you decide that um, not only were you going to put your faith in him for your salvation, but you wanted to give him your life to do whatever he wanted. Sure. So I did grow up in a ministry home. Um, my dad was never a pastor, but an assistant pastor and worked on, you know, church staff and all that my entire life. And um, there are many people that definitely influenced me in this way and in this area of serving him full time. And I'll mention a couple of those in a minute, but um, the very first people I always look to there is my parents. Mm -hmm and the fact that they just made it look good. That, um, and I know that that's not everybody's story, but it is mine. My story is that my parents served the Lord and they loved me and mm. loved my, my sisters and just gave us a wonderful, wonderful life that mm. never, um, never made me feel like it was one or the other or mm. it just, that just was life and mm. life was really, really good. Mm. You know, they were in the ministry and my life was really good because of it. So, mm. <laughs> so I would say they were definitely the foundation. I don't feel like they, they did not push me at all. I don't feel like I was called by them or anything, but 
but just the fact that they gave me a very good taste in my mouth for the mm -hmm. ministry and made it very real and it was not too faced and all of that, you know, it was just very consistent. So I would look to my parents first, but um, sometime between the age of five and nine, um, I know I can remember going forward in a church service and I don't think it had anything to do with the, um, with the sermon but just surrendering to full-time ministry. I can remember walking forward and one of the assistant pastors, I can remember saying that to him, that I feel like I'm supposed to be in full-time ministry. And so I you know, wrote my name down and all that, made the decision. But then at the age of nine, um, I believe I was fourth grade, um, by that point, I had been influenced by two different families. One of them was my kindergarten teacher, actually, Mrs. Rhoda Smith, Robert Rhoda Smith. And she only taught kindergarten one year and she was my teacher that kindergarten year. And uh, she, they, that summer they were going to be going on deputation to move to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So that whole year we heard about the kids in Africa, all the children, you know, just, and my mom even has more memories of me coming home talking about all the kids in Africa and everything. And we would stand in a circle and pray for them. And I don't remember quite all of that, but I, I remember knowing that she was going to be a missionary that really having a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. Then when I was about third or fourth grade, a family that had been on the field for several years, um, were in a very jungle remote area. They came home for a furlough and they came to our school and showed slides during our library time. Like we would go to the library and they would, they showed slides and told stories. And I will never forget the very, very jungle primitive um, natives mm. holding this incredibly white bleach blonde hair, little blue eyed girl holding her, like Aww. two two or three year old little girl. Mm -hmm. And as a fourth grader, I can remember sitting there thinking, I cannot believe that mom <laughs> would, not that she wouldn't take care of her daughter you know, and, and, and would be a bad mom, but that she would, I remember thinking that she would love God enough mm -hmm. to let her children, you know, be touched and handled and be around those people like that, mm -hmm. you know? That just, that really, really impacted me. And, um, you know, of course, while they were there, they spoke at the church. And so anyway, um, by the time I was in fourth grade, nine years old, again, had nothing to do with the sermon, but on a Sunday night, I went forward and surrendered to be a missionary. Wow. And um, of course, my mom explained, you know, that surrendering, you know, is, is wonderful. They were totally for that, of course, but, um, but just tried to teach me that, you know, whatever the Lord had for me was probably gonna come through my husband someday. Mm. And um, so just to kind of, wait and just be open, not, not don't get so zeroed in and settled. Like I just absolutely, you know, have to, and that might not be everybody's story, everybody's testimony, but that was mine. I was just yeah. surrendering. I had a burden and she was just trying to show me that, you know, just stay open and, and all that. And I'm, I'm so glad she did because, um, I, I did go through different time periods through my high school years that I thought, I mean, I'd love to come back to Hammond Baptist and teach mm -hmm. at Hammond Baptist. And I thought, you know, I love English, I love music. And so there were, and I didn't have to struggle with, I thought, you know, I, I don't know for sure what God has for me. I just kind of went through those times. So anyway, then I met Jason, of course. And so then I knew <laughs> I had been right at nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> So you uh, mentioned being right at nine years old. So, uh, and I do believe, you know, our daughter Catherine told me at 12 one night that God told her she was going to marry Zach Kinsman and she did. Yeah. And I didn't know what to say to her as a 12 year old girl, but I praise the Lord. He gave me the presence of mind and the wisdom to say, you know, always listen to the voice of God when he talks to you because, yeah. uh, and I do believe he does communicate things like that. Sometimes very big life events. Yeah. I, I yeah. truly believe he does. Look at Samuel in the mm -hmm. Bible. Yeah. Um, so you met your husband in college, mm -hmm. and um, how did you how did you meet? So I was actually a senior in college. Um, he was a junior, so he'd been there for three years, and I had never seen his face, heard his name, <laughs> was completely unaware of him, did not know he was there. Mm -hmm. We were in two different ministries. Okay. And he was just more quiet, you know. Um, so I believe it was two weeks before I graduated. Um, I walked in my mom's office one day at the college and she said, some guy asked your dad if he could ask you oh, out. Wow. So I quickly called my dad. I was like, who is this guy? And he's like, I can't remember his name for sure, but <laughs> it's like McCarthy or MacArthur or something, you know? Hmm. Well, I had a girl that worked, I had a friend that worked in the um, yearbook office. So we quickly ran down to the yearbook office and she looked up and he knew, he knew that Jason was a junior. Okay. So we looked through all the juniors and found the McRae. So I called dad again. I was like, is it Jason McRae? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yes. And anyway, mm -hmm. so after chapel, like a couple days later, I think that same friend and I were walking out of the back of chapel 
and um, she turned around and saw Peeps coming towards me, and she deserted me and left me alone. Oh, <laughs> that's, I love those friends. Yeah, so anyway, he came up and asked me, just he asked me out to go on a date. So we went on like two dates right before I left for the summer of tour. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really get the ball rolling until I came back the fall semester. I was coming back for my master's, I already knew that. So anyway, um, so we really started dating the beginning of my master's year, but met and kind of started at the end of my senior year. And did you know when you met and when you started dating that he wanted to be a missionary, that he was he, called to be? He okay. told me on our very first date, wow. um, just some previous experiences that he had had, he thought I should, he's like, I thought I should get that information out there right away. <laughs> <laughs> so he told me on our very first date and uh, told, told me later that he was really excited and thrilled that I didn't that I, I, I mean, I did not, I wasn't scared about that or I did, I just, you know, it's like, oh, good, you know, kind of. Isn't it funny <laughs> in Bible college and everybody has these stories, so, you know, yeah. but it's so funny what's important to people. Yeah. Um, I had two guys stop dating me because they heard my parents were divorced. Yeah. So when I got to my husband, you know, our first date, I said, I think I should probably tell you my parents are divorced <laughs> and apparently that's a thing. Yeah. So if you're not comfortable with that. You know, yeah. we might as well just end this now. So uh, anyway, I understand that a little bit different scenario, but uh, the importance yeah. of, yeah, I'm going to be a missionary. So he was serious about it. Wanted yeah, to he, know, yeah, in fact, he already knew that he was planning to be on the India team, which I okay. you know years later that changed to being the Philippine team or the Indophil team. But, um, but anyway, so on our first date, he told me that. Hmm. Then when I came back from summer tour and we had another date finally, um, it was literally the Friday right before college was going to start and we just met at the college mm -hmm. and you know it had stretched out so long over the summer that I remember you know going to that date telling mom I just I don't really know and I just I feel like I'm just kind of giving him one more chance because I just I feel like I, I kind of owe it to him or like we've been gone all summer we just kind of need another chance to get to know each other and um, so that was how I left the house. And when I came back, I had an armful of books on India yeah. <laughs> from the library. Wearing a sari. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> I have a red yeah. hat. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, yeah. And she just looked at me and said, what happened on that date? <laughs> but as funny oh, as that is, funny. I remember walking out of the college that first, or that day after our date. And you know, we just said goodbye up at the front doors. You know, he didn't walk me all the way out. And I remember walking from the front doors all the way up to the car, almost in a stupor, not a mushy romantic, I'm so in love with this guy. I mean, I, I was definitely more interested and had very much enjoyed that day, but it was more so, I was very sober. Mm -hmm. I walked out thinking, this is it. I just, I knew it. I knew he was the one after that, that particular, that whole date, he had brought this ginormous book on India, like a big <laughs> coffee table type book and had just, I think he, it's like, I told her, but does she really know? <laughs> like, does she really understand what I meant by that? Mm. So we, we just, a lot of our date that day was him talking about all the stuff he had studied on India and just his plans and what the team was going to do. And, and, um, so anyway, I, I just, that was the date. I just knew, mm. you know, very sober minded about it, that I knew that this was the one, mm. you know? So I tell young girls, I told our own two daughters and any other young girls that I get the opportunity to speak with. It is important to not um, put yourself in a box as far as who you're yeah. looking for or who you're willing to date. Um, I know a lot of girls I was in school with, they were just looking for the next Billy Sunday. And if they didn't think you checked all the boxes, they weren't going to give you a chance. Yeah. And the truth is, you don't know what God is going to use your husband to do. Right. And so, develop him into. Yes. You know? yeah. And so it's important that you that you find the, the guy, the man, that you allow God to bring him into your life right. no matter what he's doing. Because you just you just don't know. You never know. Right. So you did go to the Philippines. You were I on did. deputation. You and your husband were missionaries to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you had two babies born there. In the Philippines. In yeah. the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And um, so talk about that for a little bit. What, were, what was your job? What did you, what was life like? Okay, so we went with a team mm -hmm. from First Baptist in Hammond. And so Jason on the team, his title or position was, um, the youth, he was the youth pastor. There were other guys that did other areas, but he was the youth pastor. And um, so we ended up really working with the teenagers, of course, that was our plan. But once we got over there and started our church, it was amazing to see how many like college age kids God brought to our ministry as well. So we ended up kind of being over both of those age groups, which was really, you know, fun and good. 
Um, so we, when we first moved to the Philippines, we were actually in Bacolod um, for six months, which is a city on the northern tip of our island. We were with by the Charlie Vest, that ministry there for about six months. And then the Lord led um, our team leader, pastor, Pastor Randy DeMoville, to move our team down about six hours south on the same island. Mm. Um, and we started our own church in um, a city called Dumaguete. Mm. And it was just right on the tip, so right on, you know, just the coast. It was beautiful. It, it is a touristy type of town. You'll see a lot of foreigners come through there. For the, There's a lot of diving over there in that area. And okay. just, anyway, so just a pretty pretty city and um, we so Jason and I were in that city for three and a half years so total four years in the Philippines and both my girls were born there we had a, a good um, hospital that we had I think three hospitals in that city but one of them was a university hospital so um, I mean my OB guy was had been a doctor for like 25 years and Aww. just I'm still in contact with her today and yeah, she's just yeah so anyway that was life there you know yeah so you were there for four years total four, of four years four years and then the Lord led you back to the States. Yes. You were in West Virginia for a time, seven, several years. Seven years. Seven years, uh -huh. okay. And the same uh, youth pastor. And, yes. And, okay. And then, just sort of out of the blue, the Lord moves you to Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been a year and something. Just a year and a month, I think. A year and a month. Yeah. And uh, your husband is pastor mm -hmm. in, in um, just outside of Tucson. Inside. Inside of Tucson. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like a mile from the U of A. Wow. Wow. That's so neat. So what is life like now for you outside of uh, scorpions and javelinas and <laughs> um, what else were the girls telling me last? Tarantulas. <laughs> yes. I was like, oh, please well, tell me more. I want to move there today. In no. case my mom is watching. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen no tarantulas at my house. Good. Okay. <laughs> Um, couple scorpions. Scorpions, Sorry. so that's better. <laughs> <laughs> They're smaller. <laughs> um, no, it's we absolutely we're really loving it. Mm -hmm. It's it's different, um, very different. You know, we expected that, of course. Um, but boy, I'm telling you, the scenery and yeah. the weather, even Arizona the weather. Is so beautiful. I know, and yeah. I was so, so like beautiful. unaware. You know, mm -hmm. like you said, it was totally out of the blue. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the time that even just the timing of it just any opportunity coming to us was out of the blue, but especially Tucson and Arizona. And I think I remember telling you at the beginning, like Tucson, like what in the world? I, I know nothing about it. You were the one that told me like, it's beautiful. It's okay. <laughs> and so after, after we went there the first time, I thought, oh, it is, it's mm -hmm. gorgeous. And uh, the neat thing about it actually is um, I had been to that church, the church that we're pastoring now, I'd been there two times before, once on tour. And then once when we were on deputation, Jason and I actually went through, now they're in a different building now than they were then, but a lot of the same people were there and Aww. vaguely remembered some of them and everything. But anyway, we had been there before hmm. to that church. So it's just neat to come full circle, you know? That is neat, very neat. All right. One question I always like to, to ask um, for the women that I've interviewed is um, what Bible, uh, and I hate to use the word characters because, and I hate to use the word stories when it relates to the Bible, but I don't have better words. Um, but what Bible characters bring you, or character brings you um, encouragement or inspiration, or who who do you like to to read about in the sure. Bible? Um, probably with just within the last handful of years, four, five, six years, um, Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. oddly enough. Um, anytime I'm asked who my favorite character is, I don't, before I probably would have just said David because I just love the Psalms and I love his life. But um, probably about four or five years ago, Mary Magdalene just became really um, up front and center for me. And, um, you know, I obviously I don't feel like my life really relates with her life. I mean, I was never possessed or, <laughs> you know, I didn't. Really? <laughs> I knew you would differ. <laughs> um, but, you know, so even though I don't relate with her specific details, I just, you know, mm. I, I think I do relate with what she must have felt about um, just indebtedness to Jesus. Mm. Just, I mean, I, 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 I often look at the disciples and the other people that followed him around and I think I can't imagine any of them being more grateful or more committed than Mary Magdalene. Right. Just knowing right. What, what all he had done for her and what he had healed her from and brought her out of and and um and so i guess i just relate to that you know mm -hmm. and, and but i really my most favorite thing about mary magdalene is it just blows my mind about um the fact that he spoke to her first yes i just can't that is probably my favorite story in the bible and mm -hmm. i just there's so much to say about that 
but that he would choose a woman, mm -hmm. that he would choose her, and that, but that she would be there, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I guess I always think, boy, I wish I would be, I, I hope that I would have been the one there, you know, mm -hmm. not that it doesn't make her any better than anybody else, but just, I just think it was her love and her just desperate, you know, realization of how much she needed him and what she had lost right. when she lost him. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so she's probably my favorite character in the Bible. I think it's interesting that, um, you know, her, uh, her reaction was so different from the disciples. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that, you know, I mean, clearly they weren't listening. Yeah. <laughs> the disciples just didn't get it. I mean, Jesus told them, I will. Right? They could have had the opportunity to be there at the most amazing yeah. event that's ever happened in history. And none of them were there. Mm -hmm. But she just was so dialed in and um, just, like you said, just lost without him. And uh, when he appeared to her, I just can't. That's one of those things that, like, on the uh, whatever TV or video or whatever we can watch anything on in heaven, I'm just dying to watch yeah. that moment yeah. um, because nobody saw it. Right. Nobody saw it. Right. Um, but, yeah, I agree. She's uh, she's one of those people, very unsung he heroine of yeah. the Bible. Yeah. Um, I feel the same way about Rahab. You know, uh, we, we know so much about Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, but we, we don't know a lot about her other mother-in-law. And, um, and I think she had a whole, so much to do with, um, you know, those people that were, I mean, they were in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Right, right. And, uh, and definitely women who we would not have put them in yeah. these special circumstances, <laughs> but God did. And uh, I think that's amazing. What about um, when you're going, everybody goes through difficult times. Uh, you do not pass through this life without having some major challenges. They're going to look different maybe than somebody else's. And it's one of the important reasons why the Bible tells us to not compare. Mm -hmm. It's so important to not yeah. compare anything about your life with somebody else's. Um, but what are some passages of scripture that you go to in difficult times or um, when things are either dark or just you're questioning something? What, what helps you? So um, I guess if you want to call it a life verse, my first time I ever remember choosing a life verse, my grandfather passed away pretty um, suddenly, tragically, mm -hmm. when I was in third grade. And sometime at, right after that, I remember just coming across that verse. I don't know if somebody preached on it, or I think I was just reading my Bible one day or something, and I just saw that verse, Psalm 46, 1, um, God is our refuge mm -hmm. and strength, a very present help in trouble. Mm -hmm. I remember reading the word refuge and feeling kind of like, huh, I know what that word means. <laughs> like just being kind of proud of myself that I knew, what, or like I just knew what a refuge was, you know. And then the word trouble, I, I just remember, I didn't understand everything that was going on or what all had happened, but I just, um, I knew the word trouble, uh, that our family was going through a troubled time, you know. And um, so that verse, I mean, that's really when I found it, but I that really stayed as my life verse. And just, I mean, every time I get a new Bible, to, to this day, I don't claim that as my life verse, but when I get a new Bible, I still feel like I have to turn to that verse and I <laughs> underline it and that's just oh. my... Um, hmm. but then I would say, uh, I've had a couple others through the years, um, just different, especially when we left for the mission field, it switched to something else, you know, to, that kind of fit that time period. But, um, I think since we moved back to the States and just got settled again, you know, in life here, um, I would say probably two chapters, um, that have really, the Lord has used quite a bit in my life. Um, I guess, I guess three chapters and that would be, um, Psalms 145. I just love that. That's a, like a worship chapter. I just love using that chapter to worship him. And then Psalms 103, mm -hmm. um, I'd say about five years ago now, the Lord really, about 2017, the Lord really started using that chapter in my life. And just, I didn't even realize how much he was, but I look back at just different things I was dealing with at that time. And there are verses in that chapter that, I mean, no wonder I kept going back to it, mm -hmm. you know? So that has still stayed a, just a, a real, um, I guess, like you said, go-to, uh, like a refuge for me to kind of run back to it. Just in my mind, I, a lot of these, I've just I've had to commit to memory because you don't always have the Bible right. or right, it's on my right. phone but you know just you just say it and it's just there and right. you know so to run to it doesn't always mean going and sitting down and opening your Bible I mean it's just there in your mind and you you know use it but um but I would say probably above all of those um the one that is I mean first and foremost constantly in my mind is Psalm 63 mm -hmm. and um it just 
I, I probably quote that just about every morning. I just, I, it's just kind of the way to start the day or something. But um, anyway, I just, I love Psalm 63. Um, probably one of my favorite verses in there is verse eight. Um, my soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. And I think it's just, um, it, it, it is definitely a comforting verse. There's a lot, in, a lot in that chapter about God's love and all of that, who he is to us. But it's also a verse that just kind of recenters me and just when there are distractions or sometimes I go to say that chapter and I realize, wow, God, I have this is I have not been in this spot for a while. Mm. Like I, I, I have not mentally and emotionally been what this chapter says. Like I feel like it draws me back. It draws my focus back. Mm. So, you know, it, it's kind of all encompassing. And I guess all those chapters, you could use them for any, you know, you're going through a hard time. It definitely all those chapters talk about things about God that are very comforting, very strengthening. Mm -hmm. But I think it also, for the most part, what it does for me is just recenter my mind and get the, get those distractions away and refocus my mind on him. The Psalms are critical, mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. especially when we're going through difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, I think often, what would the Bible be without the largest book? And it's a song book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so much strength and comfort is gained yeah. when we turn to the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's it's been amazing to me doing these interviews, um, how many times the Psalms has been mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and that's just a it's a it's a wonderful uh, tribute and credit to the mercy of God for yeah, thinking exactly. to give us that, you know, mm -hmm. so that we would be comforted. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. And um, thank you all for watching. And uh, if you have any um, questions or anything about today's video, please don't hesitate to ask. You can email me at amybassick at gmail.com. If you haven't subscribed, please do, please do so. I keep getting yelled about that every time. Remind them to subscribe. <laughs> and uh, so hit the red subscribe and ring the bell so you get notified when there's a new video up. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.